which is, um, so we're coming together to talk about this really important topic, welcoming and supporting new Americans. And you're here, so I don't have to convince you why that's important. I do want to kind of emphasize and set the stage that rural communities have a really unique kind of um, opportunity to create a welcoming environment and an infrastructure that is supportive, not just in short term, but in long term. And some of the folks that we've invited to share their stories and experiences today have been on the ground with being a part of that work. And that work is coming from lots of different areas of, um, uh, of society. And there's really no part of our world that's not involved with it. So banking, retail, anything you can imagine is involved in this process. And so we're really excited to hear from a few different folks that have different, um, different uh, processes that they've used, different um, things that they've done in their community to, to be able to learn from that and collaborate in the future. And this is really good for us too. It brings creativity, vitality, diversity, and opportunity for addressing things like population decline. So this is really good for us too. So now um, we will get to our, uh, our first four presentations. Um, the first one is Veronica Reyes. And she is a Latino lending specialist in Nebraska with the Center for Rural Affairs. She herself is from Venezuela and at one point was also a newcomer to America herself. And so we're very excited to have her here and be talking about what's going on in Nebraska and why are things working so well in your particular uh, corner of America. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Juliana, for that amazing presentation. <laughs> I'm gonna start uh, explaining you guys um, where I work and what we do, and then I will go from there. I think it's gonna be easier that way. I'm going to present now. Okay, can you see my presentation, Juliana? Just okay, yeah, just check in. Yeah, you can see it. Perfect. Okay, the Center for Rural Affairs. It's a. Mm, I can change this. Okay, it's a nonprofit organization um, focus on community development in different areas. Um, we do um, business development, which is what I specifically do. We have also um, different programs that seek to create opportunities for rural people to reduce poverty, build wealth, improve family self-sufficiency, engages across cultural divides and expand local leadership. We seek to empower rural people to help themselves grow as community and have a sense of agency. Um, we, our mission, main mission is establish strong rural communities, social and economic justice, environmental stewardship, and genuine opportunity for all while engaging people in decisions that affect the quality of their lives and the future of their communities. And it's funny because I remember when I first uh, had my 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 first conversation with Juliana, she asked me, how long did it take for you to 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 oh, sorry, I'm just trying to get trying to see the top of my okay there. How, how long did it, it took for the center to, to do this to achieve all of these uh, programs and, and get to all the people and develop all the communities in the way you have done it? Well, we were founded in 1973. So it's not only three years or, 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 or three months. It, it's been a while for the center to be working on different things at the same time. Um, the center envisions rural economies where racial and gender disparity no longer exist. And that's been a big fight with Native American communities and with the Latino communities for being, being part of the United States now. The, our main office is in Lyons in Nebraska, and we have satellite offices throughout this the entire state. And I'm going to show you in a minute a map where we have, um, where you can see where we have a presence of somebody that works in a program, it doesn't matter which, in Nebraska. So we have, of course, in Lyons, we have the most presence because that's where the accounting and administrative uh, work is done but we do have in different towns all around Nebraska and in different cities. And we not only have the employees of the center in different cities, but we also have contractors that represent the center and work for us uh, in cities that are not even mentioned here, uh, bigger or smaller. 
Our main program areas um, are the policy program, and they work, the staff that work there, uh, they do everyday people to advocate for public policies, help build a bright, vibrant rural future using grassroots organizing, policy development, direct advocacy, and media strategies. Some of the areas we focus on include access to healthcare, fair tax policy, clean energy development, small business policies, and policy to support family scale farming. Um, for example, we had in Nebraska last year a tax incentive for uh, business owners that spend X amount of money in the year. And this, this uh, incentive was approved by, the, the, by, by a law that our policy program put through the capital building and all the process they do. I'm not very familiar with what they do. That's their thing, but I know it affects a lot of our, our, our work in the other programs, farm and community and, and lending. In the farm and community program, they work with rural Nebraskans to help their communities thrive, such as organizing Spanish language YouTube channels with local content, helping Chamber of Commerce build bridges to new immigrant communities, and working on Native American tribal food sovereignty. I don't know how to say that word. Sorry. English is a second language sometimes. No, sovereignty. <laughs> um, yeah, no problem. Yeah, abandoned me <laughs> through community gardens. Um, the, the work that farm and community do, it's very interesting. They they work as a bridge between the community and other organizations that can help the community grow. Specifically, they, they have done a great work with Native Americans and also with Latinos farming in this state. And of course, my favorite topic, the small business program, because it's where I work. I've been here for five years now, and um, we help small entrepreneurs that already have their business on, or want to have their business to grow and thrive. We have uh, online courses and in-person training, English and Spanish all over the state. We have technical assistance bilingual all over the state, and we have access to loan capital and networking. We have business loans up to $250,000 um, and we have different funds. We can work with all kind of, of uh, community people in, in regards of immigration status, which is something that I find very exciting. Um, okay, that's about the center. That's about our programs and our what we do now. Um, we have a very small community here in Nebraska uh called Skyler. In Skyler, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Skyler is a community of about 6,000 people. But Skyler has a, a peculiarity, let's put it that way, that uh gets a lot of immigrants. We say that about 80, 70 to 80 percent of people in Skyler are mostly immigrants. And it's uh because of probably one big factor, which is the big companies that work around Skyler. We have, for example, a company called Cargill. It's a meat processor uh, factory that they put in incentives to bring people in. Incentives as we will pay your rent for three months. We're going to give you a monthly health, um, food, um, health and food um, aid for when you establish here. They pay for the trip of the person that's been hired. They can hire remotely and they can do the the all the interview process remotely. So when the person comes here, it already has a job. It already has a house. It already It's already settled with house, food, and work, and they can just go from there. Um, and they also have uh, extra incentives for people that stay. I don't know. It, it depends on the company because several of them do this. Uh, if you stay six months or one year or 18 months, whatever, you get a $1,000 incentive in addition to that. On top of that, our work with the different organizations in the community, like Chambers of Commerce, it's very close with the center. If you go to the Chamber of Commerce and you're a Latino and you need a, um, a business or you want to have a business, they are going to send that person to me if it is in a chamber of my area. I work in Northeast Nebraska and we have specialists all around you know, the state. And it's our work or it's our job to make those connections with the chambers or community development or economical development or other organizations that work for the community. Since I work specifically with Latinos, we also have an organization in my town. I live in Columbus, which is 20 minutes from Skyler, um, called Centro Hispano. And it's focused on helping not only Latinos, but also any immigrant that needs uh, legal help. 
They also offer classes like GED classes for free. They also have a business program, small business program in collaboration with us. And we've been working together for years now. Like this relationship, we have them all over the state with different organizations. And we just started with the Somalian community to build this type of relationship too. We, we found we, one of our contractors is a Somalian, a recent addition to, to our team. And it's very interesting because the cultures are completely different and things are done completely different in different countries. So it's very exciting. Our job is, I learn something new every single day from every single client. And, and it's, it's very exciting to see how the community grows and we are helping them to do so. I guess if I, don't know if, <laughs> <laughs> if, I don't know if somebody has any questions now or we're gonna open them at the end. Of every presentation. Uh, yeah, we'll probably do discussion and questions toward the end, but I just wanted to make a comment that the way that I got connected with you and found out what was going on in Skylar was another um, like webinar or something that I was on with, um, I know there was like Center for Rural Affairs and there were some others, um, or sorry, yeah, Center for Rural Affairs and Corey and some others like that. And I remember that statistic of the population being about 6,000 and then 70 to 80% being new Americans. And I was like, what is happening there? <laughs> you know, like how, like what's working there to, to recruit and maintain and support. And um, one of the comments that was made was that the more rural the place, the more likely folks are to rely on entrepreneurship to make a living. And so it's really interesting how organizations like Center for Rural Affairs and others that you're connecting folks with are, are placed and ready to help folks. Yes, they might be employed by some of those private uh, companies that are helping to recruit them, but there's others who may rely on entrepreneurship um, to make a living. And I think it's really great that that whole infrastructure is there and ready to support them. So I very much appreciate your presentation and I'm excited to get to the questions later on. I'm sure folks will have other questions for you. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, no Thank you. We will now um, head over to our Project Home team. Project Home is a grassroots nonprofit supporting asylum seekers in Keene, New Hampshire, which is where we happen to be located. Um, and we have a couple of folks from that team. Susan Hay is the one that will be giving the presentation. We also have Judy Reed and Eric Swope here who are volunteers um, and work part of the core team for Project Home as well. All right, Susan, you are on. You're muted. I think I can unmute you. Let me see if I can do that. You got me. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, can people see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay, excellent. Um, I, that was so wonderful to hear that, Veronica. I have a million questions. But right now I'm here to talk with you about um, Project Home and um, uh, just a model of bringing, and that's it, a model, not the model, of bringing people to rural communities. So let me start with, um, what is Project Home? We are an all volunteer, grassroots nonprofit, and we are committed to bringing asylum seekers here in our community that live with host families throughout not all, but much of their asylum seeking process. Our model says we bring a family or individual in, we place them with host families. We put a team leader and a support team around each hosting situation so that it all doesn't fall on the host family. Um, and, and then we set out meeting their basic needs, you know, getting them connected with the community, getting them connected with resources and legal and medical and um, uh, whatever they need. There are some very common needs and then there are specific things that any given individual or family would need. Um, we work off of an accompaniment model, which has been very, very important to us in term. And so, you know, my, my way of explaining that is while our work can be construed as charitable, we don't hold it as charity. We see ourselves as walking in solidarity with our guests and, and accompanying them through their process. We know some things about the process that they may not know, but at the end of the day, they are their own agents. They make their own decisions. 
we can give advice, but at the end of the day, you know, we, we defer to their competency whenever possible. Um, uh, how do we get started? It was late 2019, and, and, and just a moment about Keene, it's a small rural um, town, not small like 6,000, but maybe 22,000, 23, and it's the big city for about an hour in any direction. Um, so we're a hub of sorts for um, uh, services. There's, um, Judy will hate this term, but there's strong social capital here, and there was an, a foundation of support already. You've already seen that Juliana introduced Eric and, and Rob as also part of, and Judy as part of CURP, um, but they're also part of Project Home. So, um, and they're also working with the Afghani efforts. But around that time, you know, they, all of the publicity and horror around kids in, kids in cages came about. And, and, you know, one person said to another, we have to do something about this. This can't happen. And then there's a slowly a little bit of bigger group and a little bit of bigger group. And then we had a committed leadership team of maybe seven to 10. Um, we went public in a vigil for um, asylum seekers. And we stood up and said, if, if asylum seekers seeking safe harbor at our borders don't belong in detention, then they must belong in our communities. And there's no reason on the planet that a town the size of Keene can't absorb at least five individuals or, uh, or families. And we asked people, we had people circulating in terms of, you know, circulating with um, uh, sign up sheets. And we asked them to sign up. And in our first meeting, we had almost 40 people. And, and so we quickly knew that our community wanted to be involved in this. Our, our leadership team met every week for months, possibly over a year. Um, and then we had once a month public meetings where all volunteers showed up. And we did some updates and we did some education and, and, and that was a very committed and still is group. We, we kind of conceptually wandered a little bit and two of our, our leaders went to the border because they wanted to see it firsthand. And that was a, an important piece of how we began to find asylum seekers that we could bring to our town. Um, so who are our guests? We have 15 guests in Keene right now, or in the Keene area. Uh, in six hosting situations, there's seven children, they're all in school. Well, if they're old enough, we have some, some little ones too, and eight adults. Most of them are south of the border and we want to have one gentleman from Africa. What do they have in common? Because a theme here is every situation, every individual, every family has their own unique challenges. But what they share is that they are all fleeing violence and poverty. That to, with no exception, they are brave, they are resilient and, and in spite, and that resilience comes in spite of the fact that they have experienced significant trauma. They all had very little English when they came here. Some literally none, and, and, but nobody was close to fluent. They all wanted to work. It was important to them. They wanted to care for their families. They all had dreams, cultural whiplash, every single one of them, because Keene is not a town full of, it's enough to come to America, but when you're coming to a very white, you know, um, with, with uh, not a strong immigrant community itself, it was, it was very intense and is. And they all face financial pressure from their broader families. These, these people have people back in their home countries that very much need funding, you know, from them. Um, so 2019, you know, which I think I talked about how we got started, right? Um, yeah you know, was that year of putting it all together. Um, in 2020, um, we, we, we went out to find that thinking we had to go find host families. Honestly, they found us. The first host family kind of crashed one of our leadership meetings to ask, how can we sign up and do this? Um, the second family accosted me in the co-op and said, we wanna know how to be a host family. So in 2020, we had two host families in February and the third in the summer. So February was 
you know, when they got here, we were about two weeks away from a pandemic being declared. Um, that put a very different spin on being connected to a family um, because the ability to engage the border community was really shut down. And so that host family and that, that the, the, our guests were in very close contact with each other for a very long time without a lot of other contact with other people. Um, and then just, you know, kids had to get in schools, doctor's appointments had to be set up. We had to find lawyers. I will tell you that this community, the schools welcomed these children with open arms. The medical care system, the hospital system has provided free medical care for our guests. And so far, knock on wood, we have had pro bono lawyers for everyone um, that, we're, that we're working with. It's, it's been an amazing year of work and learning, ups and downs, and, and just a ton of love going back and forth. Um, in 2021, the rest of our guests joined us. Um, so that went, we went from three families to six or, or three hosting situations. Two of our hosted guests started to move towards independence, um, meaning that they didn't need to be in a host family any longer. They were ready to be more independent. The challenge was and continues to be delays, 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 delays. Um, work authorization that at one time was going to come in six months and then the Trump administration pushed it to 12 months. We were still 18 months out in some cases, 20 months out, 24 months out, and the, the work authorization authorizations have not come. Individuals that got their work authorization and then got an extension of it suddenly are not getting extensions. Um, um, and so it's a system backed up. And while I believe in not explaining, not attributing to malice what can be explained by incompetence, I think it's a little bit of both in, in terms of this delay and inability of the system to, to, um, to actually get these people what they have been committed to receiving in terms of work authorizations, driving licenses, things like that. Um, and we've done a lot of work to define the transition process because with all of this delays, it turns out to be different than maybe we envisioned it. And, and to say, you know, when is somebody ready? What do they need in terms of support? It's requiring us to provide financial support a lot longer than we thought we were going to have to. Um, and, and we're doing a lot of contracting with our guests around what will, what will Project Home continue to do and what do we need you to be you know, um, taking care of along the way. Um, uh, wait a minute. And now this year, literally all our clients are in transition now on the move. Um, there is enormous challenges in Keene, New Hampshire and the surrounding communities to finding affordable housing. I don't think that's unique to us, but it is putting a lot of pressure on our, our guests' ability to move. We're very excited to be celebrating the fact that two young women are graduating from high school in, in, um, in June and one is going to be pursuing college. Um, we continue to grapple with what does the road to independence mean and our role with this. Court cases have started to come back and there is some movement on you know, their, their, their applications moving through the court system. It's still really, really slow. And as an organization, um, you know, I was so impressed with uh, Veronica's organization that's been around since 1973. We're really trying to figure out what, what's our 10 year vision and maybe a three year plan from where do we wanna go from here? Um, What's, what's been critical to this success? Um, that core team was very willing to make this a personal priority. As I said, these are all volunteers, but people can be working. Some people just drive somebody to a, a doctor's appointment. And some people I am absolutely confident work 20 to 30 hours a week on this. The pre-work that the organization that Eric's gonna talk about, Curb, um, Curb done in the community really created interest and passion and a desire to help immigrants. And that was under important, as was understanding accompaniment. If that's the pair of glasses you want to have on when you're working with people, it really, it helps you understand how you want to intervene and not intervene in particular situations. You got to fundraise. 
to do that, you know, it's not free. Um, um, but I will tell you, since I'm in charge of fundraising here, it's easier than you may think. People are really looking to be able to help. Um, you have to build the volunteer. In order to do this model, you have to build a volunteer base. Um, and, and again, I can't say enough about our volunteers. They are count onable day in and day out. You know, so this question about rural settings, what we definitely think that this is at where we agree with Juliana that this is a wonderful um, setting for uh, um, uh, asylum seekers and immigrants at writ large. Um, we see the sweet spot you know, but that's just maybe because this is where we are at sort of a, you know, a 20 to 40,000, you know, resident um, community um, that has, because they have enough services. We also think that communities of this size just inherently have more of a sense of community than you get to be in a bigger setting. It's not like we would tell Boston, we wouldn't help them. It's just, it's a very different, it's a very different game. Also selfishly, we know that if we're bringing asylum seekers to our town at this site, it has an impact on the community. That our guests are visible, you know, they're known, they're connected with, they're in our high schools, in our grammar schools, and we think that totally benefits the community. Right now, in our economy, workers are needed in this town. So there's, there's definitely jobs if you have work authorization. Um, the challenges here are we are rural and there's a lack of good transportation services and some other services that might be really important for um, uh, asylum seekers. They, we don't have much of a culturally relevant community for most of our guests, although we're building that one guest at a time. And if the economy changes, the availability of job, jobs might change. Um, Challenges that we faced and continue to face. The external systems you know, can be heartbreaking. The legal process, the asylum seeking process, um, the courts, ICE, they're all, um, they're all pretty cruel and hard to penetrate. In some cases, the depth of trauma that our guests have experienced really call for clear mental health support. Um, you know, we weren't ignorant of that, but um, sometimes, you know, we weren't fully prepared for it either. We've gotten good support and it, it mattered. Lack of housing continues to be an issue. Um, and, you know, in, in our world, all pro bono immigration lawyers are working at about 200% of capacity. If we're really going to make a difference for new Americans, we have to grow up and pay um, immigrant lawyers. We don't, there's just not enough of a, of a um, farm team in that. Um, and hold on, I'm almost done. The joys. When you can think of and see children who have been in our country for two weeks, getting on a school bus, not speaking the language and going into their elementary school, they are so brave. And it's, it's an honor to work with them and they are thriving in school. I have rarely seen anybody happier than the two guests that we have that have gotten their driver's license. And it's heavy lifting. There's the language, you know, um, just the, the guy that's helping her drive, not Eric, by the way, is our driver's ed person, but we, they also have to go through official driver's ed. And to have one of the guests say to me, he told me to not get on the shoulder of the road. What does that mean? He told me to stick my nose out. What is he talking about? <laughs> um, working with a team of people that this is the best team I've ever worked with. You know, lots of trust, lots of joy. Um, seeing, I'm very proud of our communities and the option, opportunity to connect with other organizations around the state, but like you, state and nation. Last thing I'd like to leave you with, it's not simple, but it's very doable work. Our asylum seekers absolutely need and deserve strong support. Um, you know, there's a saying among lawyers, uh, a bad lawyer, a good case is trumped by a good lawyer every day in the courts. You know, if our asylum seekers don't have good legal representation, they don't, they don't get to stay here. 
this is just one model. There's a million ways and, you know, to help people, you know, in this situation. And the last thing is, this is an important part of our mission. We would be delighted to help anybody think about how they can start supporting asylum seekers or maybe, you know, move to a, a home, you know, a hosted situation in rural environments. It's actually part of our mission. Um, so that's, that's our story. Susan, that was wonderful. Thank you so much um, for sharing. And what you can do is just stop screen share yep. uh, before we go to the next presenter. Yep. yep. Um, I, I volunteer with Project Home as well. And one thing that I have loved to see is that although there are times when volume is important, um, you know, such as with some refugee situations, but Project Home is so intentional and has individual relationships with each guest and it the conscientiousness and care that goes into the accompanying work that they do is just beautiful to see. And um, I think the mechanics you put in your presentation are also really helpful to folks who may be considering, um, you know, trying to do something like this in their community. So I love the differences between what's happening in Veronica's kind of corner of the country and what's happening here. Uh, so next, we're going to get a, a perspective from uh, Carla Castillo Delgado. Uh, she is a Latino business consultant who specializes in supporting Hispanic entrepreneurs in Western North Carolina. She's also a dear friend. Um, we went to one year of high school together, and she was so patient and, and loving, helping me try to practice my Espanol, <laughs> which I still need to work on, but uh, it's getting better, so... We so appreciate you being here and are excited to hear how um, the work about the work you're doing in North Carolina. Uh, thank you, Juliana. Yes, I, I remember you. We went salsa dancing also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going again this summer. I can't wait. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, so my name is Carla Castillo and my perspective is from also a newcomer. When I was young, I came to the US. My family brought me here. Um, English is my second language. Um, obviously, Spanish has been something that has given me a lot of tools to now in my day to day job to help the Latinx community. That's the community that I focus on. Um, so I am the CEO of Alcanzar Consulting in Asheville, North Carolina. Alcanzar means to reach. And my job started because, um, first of all, my background as an immigrant newcomer, and also because I started working in nonprofits, um, especially like lending uh, CDFIs that were helping or wanted to help the Latinx community. So they hired me um, to do that job also as a chef instructor and also my career as a psychologist. So all of this has led me to start um, Alcanzar Consulting. And basically here in North Carolina, we have over a million of Latinx um, Hispanic population. I'm gonna be using Hispanic Latinx um, to be able to tell you guys what I'm doing with the community. So in North, in North Carolina, the Hispanic population is now greater than 1 million. And we know that even though the Latinx community are 1.7 times more likely to start a business, they only owe 3% of the US farmland according to the USD census. So, so much of the agricultural, uh, agricultural knowledge is in the white community. And even though the Latinx community come to this country, immigrants come to this country, most of their knowledge is based in, you know, from their country that they're coming from. Um, so most of the Latinx farmers have the agricultural knowledge, but not of the understanding and the laws and regulations here in the US. Um, and also the Latinx farmers are also experiencing discriminatory lending practices across um, the country. So Alcanzar Consulting is a bilingual consulting agency that is providing coaching and also um, other services to any entrepreneur that comes to, um, to seek my help. Basically, we offer services like marketing and branding, bookkeeping, tax preparation, business registration, permits, and licensing. Also, I focus on doing free workshops to be able to give uh, the Latinx community the education that they need in order to understand what it takes to start a business. Um, most of the people that come to me have no knowledge about any of the laws and regulation, the IRS, North Carolina, whichever agency they're, they're worrying about. 
So the free workshops are about legal structure, uh, the permits that they need, also just basic steps on how to start their business. I also support the Latinx community because of my background in the lending uh, nonprofit that I was working, the CDFI, with how to, how do you start the loan application. Um, one of the things that I saw working with CDFIs is that they have all this money coming in from the government, all these grants, but sometimes when they go out there in the community, it's so difficult for them to be able to advertise and to really connect with the community since um, they don't really have somebody that speaks the language. Their application process is all in English and, you know, we understand that it has to be done in Spanish. So, they don't invest the money to translate all the documentation. So my job when I was working for these CDFIs was to do a lot of translation, which wasn't really my job, but I was being held accountable for all the translation that was that needed to be done. So it's a very difficult job to do, but many times, um, you know, they kind of give you all these uh, responsibilities to be able to support all the Latino community in the counties in Buncombe County and Henderson County. Also, um, I also support with other resources in the community. And my focus is to implement um, strategies that will help them achieve their goals and to deliver uh, real results. Uh, basically, I sit down with them. I understand uh, what their struggles, their opportunities, what they need as an entrepreneur. And even if they're not entrepreneurs, most people also seek my help if they have any problems um, understanding any other applications. I try not to give them any legal advice when it comes to immigration because that's a very difficult topic and I am not allowed to do that. But I'm also a notary. So I help them to understand a lot of things in, in the legal aspect. I don't give them any legal advice, though. Um, we create a unique plan for each business, understanding their cultural background, their cultural needs, and the obstacles that they're facing when it comes to obtaining financial uh, support. And that is one of the biggest issues that I see with every nonprofit that I've worked with, especially in the CDFI world, um, that they have the, the opportunity to support them, but the all the, re all the requirements are very difficult for a, a newcomer or an immigrant to understand. And most of the time, the application process can be very long. Um, so that's another issue that we see in our community. Um, Alconsar Consulting is with the entrepreneur from the beginning of their journey to the end. Um, I try to understand what phase of their business they're in. And with that in mind, I also do some outsourcing. I try to work with people that are pretty professional, that are not trying to take advantage of the Latinx community for the lack of their understanding um, or the laws. And um, I try to also give them, you know, my best advice in when it comes to how to start their business. And if they want to expand or grow, I give that too. Um, and uh, my mission is to create um, resources and to find resources for the Latinx community to be able to have successful and healthy businesses in the community. So that's really what my passion is about, to see a entrepreneur being able to find um, my, like capital for their business and to also see them have the opportunities that any non-white uh, business would have. Thank you. Carla, that was amazing. Um, thank you for all the incredible work you're doing in that corner of the country. And I have lots of questions for you. I'm sure others do too. Um, we have one more group. So we have Eric Swope, Lori Jameson, and Rob Maggi joining us from kind of two different groups, the Keene Immigrant and Refugee Partnership and the Monadnock Neighborhood Support. Um, and so we have about 10 minutes because we want to have plenty of time for discussion. But Eric, take it away. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. So I'm going to start off talking a little bit about the Keen Immigrant and Refugee Partnership. Um, so the other group that we're talking about is actually a spinoff of, that, of this group. So, but the Keen Immigrant and Refugee Partnership, or CURP for short, was formed in 2017. I joined it about a year later. But it was formed in 2017 when you remember there is increasingly hostile rhetoric and actions against immigrants in our country. And uh, we were disturbed by that. It's not the country we wanted to live in. We wanted to live in a country where, where our new neighbors are welcomed and we reach out our hands and embrace them. We want them, we want them in our communities and we want them to know that we want them in the community. And so this group formed basically as a counter to that, to that rising rhetoric and, and the negative actions that we were seeing. 
And it, it was primarily on the national level, but it was filtering down to the local level. That was very tr troublesome to us. And so we formed this group. Um, and I, I'm going to say we, even though, again, I didn't join it for the first, first, first year or so. But I was in the same boat, having, floundering in my own darkness, trying to, trying to figure out what to do about this. But we formed this group to respond to that. Um, we, uh, we got together and just started talking about what we could possibly do that would make things more welcoming. A lot of things kind of sprung out of that. The very first thing or the main first thing that, that happened was our group, our group got together and talked to the city council, brought a resolution to them, basically seeking that they would ensure that our city police were more welcoming, would not, for instance, if they had a traffic stop, would not be asking somebody for their documentation and turning them over to ICE if they didn't have the proper documentation. We wanted them to, you know, we wanted the, that to be a statement that our city council would make, and they they agreed to it, not quite unanimously, but overwhelmingly. Um, so that was an important first step for us. We've done a lot of other things since then. We've um, um, found various needs within the community, and for instance, we uh, had a free dental day. We had a, a dental office who donated an entire day to seeing people who didn't could not afford their health, health um, dental insurance did a lot of follow-up work with them too. Some of that was quite expensive, and, and it, but it was all free to this, these people who otherwise would just have to suffer with, their, with the issues they were facing. Um, we have, have done a lot of commu little community mixers. We brought people together from different ethnicities and backgrounds, and, and we shared food, shared stories, songs, and poems, and you know, just kind of a, a, a beautiful We helped to secure uh, funding for housing. Some of the some of the people were hit particularly hard and did not benefit from some of the government funding. You know, some of the rescue plan funding. So we were able to help them secure funding for housing. We took some donations in. We were able to help them find. In some some cases, we were able to help supply groceries throughout the pandemic. Uh, we worked with our local community kitchen and delivered food to some of the households. Uh, we we did a number of of different things, and and that that. Um, project uh, the 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 curb group continued on or it continues on even now, but um, during the pandemic we slowed down a lot and we were kind of losing our footing a little bit, and we got together during the summer I think it was of 2020 or 2021 and, and basically said are we going to fold or are we going to really kind of regroup a little bit and we decided it was time to regroup a little bit, and not you know we we kind of got some other projects on, underway, and not too long after that the whole thing in Afghanistan started to unfold in front of us. Um, as the US troops, you know, I won't recount the whole thing, but as US troops with, withdrew, a lot of people who had been working for impro great improvements in their country and trying to make a, a better place for them for themselves to live in, suddenly were in grave danger as the Taliban started to take over and, and people were fleeing the country. We had greater than 60,000 Afghan refugees coming to the United States. I don't remember what the final number or what the current number is, but it's, it's somewhere well north of that, I believe. This presented quite a huge problem for um, our resettlement agencies. So the resettlement agencies had been decimated during the Trump regime. Uh, whenever Trump was in office, he, um, he capped at a very low number, the number of refugees coming into, into the country. And in turn, the agencies that did the resettlement were suddenly forced to lay off tons of people. Um, he's, you know, Trump also cut severely on the, on the agencies that deal with immigrants and all the, all the paperwork that's required. So, so the system was, was kind of squeezed way down. Um, the resettlement capacity was, was much, much lower than it had been in recent decades. And then all of a sudden 60,000 people were coming into the country. Um, so we, we saw this unfolding and we wanted to do something about it. We wanted to see if we could maybe be a, a helping hand in Keene. So the Keene immigrant, uh, the Curb Group, we had three representatives that myself, um, Judy Reed and Joe Shapiro, we reached out to the, th the three resettlement agencies in the area. There are two in New Hampshire, the International Institute of New England and a Century of Care Alliance. And there's also one over in Brattleboro, the um, Ethiopian Council for Economic Development or something like something similar to that. But anyway, um, a century responded to us and basically told us they were changing their models. So they had been used to dealing with maybe, I don't know, I don't remember what the number is, but a, a much smaller number of refugees coming in in a given year. And suddenly there were, you know, 
at, at a time whenever they had, had laid off a lot of their staff, they were just overwhelmed with this flood. And so rather than being the, the be all end all in, in doing all of the work through their agency, they started a new model with neighborhood support teams where basically they would ask different groups of people to, to form little support teams and each one adopt a family or several families and just help them with the resettlement process. And so we decided we would like to do that. We brought that idea back to Keene and we, we reached out to the community to see if we could find some support for this. Uh, we had our, just from reaching out through our own little networks in our first meeting, we had about 40 people show up for it. Um, so that was very encouraging. Um, so Accentria basically assured us if we could, if we could do the, the steps of forming a team, doing some fundraising and finding some housing, that they would be sending us a family. And so it took us a little while to do that. Um, I think the, our first meeting was the first, our, our first full meeting as a team was the first week of January. And we've been meeting once a week since then. Um, so some of us have been meeting a number of other, you know, we have other little mini meetings in between and, and a, lot of, a lot of phone call converse, phone conversations to try to you know, work things out as we go. But so since that time, we've developed a team. We have um, probably a couple of dozen very committed people who are currently part of the team. Um, we've got a number of committees and each committee is responsible for certain segments of the resettlement or of the resettlement process. Um, Right now, we, we had our, our first family arrive just maybe a little bit more than a month ago, and they're settling into Keene. It's, it's been a very, um, a very time consuming process, but it's also been a very rewarding process. They're just, you know, it's just been a, just a joy to welcome them in, and they're very happy to be here. It consists of a, a mother and a father and an eight year old son. The eight year old son is now in school. Um, and I've been talking quite a bit, and I want to give my co-leaders a, ch a chance to speak a little bit too. So I'm going to turn this over to Rob. Rob, you're muted. Let's see. How about now? There we go. Okay. I'm going to talk about some things we didn't necessarily expect with our family, who's been just tremendous, and they're very, very happy. Uh, I happen to live very close to them, and I'm one of the people that sees them frequently. But the important, one of the things I want to really stress is the importance of asking questions, and don't leave things up to them always asking you questions. And I'll tell you a, a couple of things that we found out. It, in discussing with the family about their family, uh, the father pulled out some records for his brother still in Afghanistan and showed it to us. And the initial part of the records were photocopies and there were a, three of us there. And so we looked at them and uh, then when they got to me, I looked a little closer and I realized that uh, the signature on this letter did not appear to be a photocopy. It turns out that the documents were all um, the written, the type documents were all original documents that his brother in Afghanistan had given to him in the hopes that he could get a refuge SIV visa to come to this country. Now, if he didn't pull this out and we didn't start asking questions, we would have missed that. So this, he's, our family here is constantly thinking about their family in Afghanistan. The brother has uh, seven children. His parents are also uh, there as well. In subsequent conversations, uh, well, I'll make this short because we're running out of time. So this is what I've learned through other conversations. Since the Taliban has left, his brother now has to hide when the Taliban comes to town. His brother is not able to work because he has to hide. His house has been invaded twice by the Taliban where they keep their records have been smashed open. His 12 year old daughter, I had a converse, uh, our, the husband, uh, the, our <laughs> Maswani introduced me to his brother on the phone and uh, in the back of the brother, there were teen children and I, their faces were not happy kids. They, they looked very depressed and what I found out afterwards was that their sister was very sick. 
And it turns out that after that conversation with the brother in Afghanistan, the 12 year old girl died. And so the faces I were seeing were the, were the girl's siblings who knew their sister was dying. Um, so the importance here is to ask questions. And yesterday I was asking him if what he brought, other files he brought. And he pulls out a folder and in that folder, I found an 18 page document from USIS uh, that no one can tell me, we're in the process now of finding out what it is, but no one can tell me what it's about. And hopefully th through another agency, we're getting a pro bono attorney that will help. But if we didn't push to ask additional questions and say, let me see what you have, we would have potentially have missed some of this. This is also compounded by the fact that he speaks Pashto and the alphabet is not based on a Roman alphabet. So we, I have to particularly rely on a translation service because his English is extremely limited. So this family is not only adjusting to the US but constantly worrying about what's happening to their family in the US. And the other comment is, I think it's also important we have to start on taking the family to give them time to talk to us in some, whether, whether we take them out for coffee or ice cream, we need to give them the opportunity to ask us more questions and start telling us more information. This family likes to entertain us with coffee, food, et cetera. And, and uh, last week he said, how come you're not eating? How come you're not drinking? And so they're looking for this. So they need that emotional support. And I'll let Lori say a few words now. Thanks, Rob. I, I, I'm gonna try and keep this really short. Um, it's been a whirlwind. The family came on March 1st. Um, so we really kind of hit the ground running. Our umbrella group, Ascentria um, Care Alliance, which is out of Massachusetts and uh -huh, New Hampshire, um, helped set us up in a little bit in that we had things that had to be completed within the first seven days, within the first 30 days, you know, and now, now we're moving on. Um, the challenges were that some of the things we were told we needed to do had already been done. So spending a total of 10 hours um, in a bank trying to set up accounts with someone who doesn't speak English <laughs> um, and then finding out he already had one <laughs> was a little frustrating, but we're getting there. I think the more experience we have, the, the easier it's, it's getting. Um, I feel much more comfortable in doing the different applications and all the paperwork needed now. Um, I can tell you it's nothing but a joy to work with these people and to go visit them um, absolutely makes all the time and effort worthwhile. And Julianne, Thank you can so I take much. a couple more things? Uh, briefly, yes. Okay, as soon as I stop talking, I remember the other things I wanted to say. <laughs> um, so as far as some challenges in, in, in a rural community, there, we don't have the resettlement framework over in Keene that they would have over in in Concord, say, or Manchester, where they've been resettling refugees for a number of years. So that's, you know, that's a little bit of a challenge, but the other side of that is that we have a very strong sense of community here. And so people are kind of coming out of the woodwork to, to help, you know, and a lot of people are interested in, in doing whatever they can to help. Um, as Sue mentioned with the fundraising, that was not really particularly difficult. We, we kind of put out the word and we, you know, we, there was some effort went into it, no doubt, but we put out the word and people responded fairly quickly and fairly substantially. Um, and one last thing, um, if you want to do something like this in your area, it, it's a lot of work, but do it. It's because there's a tremendous need. Awesome, thank you so much. And I'm just so grateful for all the different perspectives that have been brought forth so far. Um, now we've come to the portion of the round table where we have open, it's kind of an open floor. So anyone who would like to share the work that they are doing in their community, um, or perhaps I know we have um, folks who were at one time New Americans themselves, if you would like to share 
your perspective, we would very much welcome that. What, what helped you when you came, what didn't help you? Um, and then also questions to the presenters as well. We would welcome that. I know we have one attendee in particular, Ari um, Hurwitz from Muncie Afghan Refugee Settlement, who does have to hop off a little early. So if they wanna jump in and um, provide any uh, portion of their experience they would like to, I would welcome that. And, and then we'll just continue with an open floor. Yeah, thank you so much, Julia. Um, my name is Ari Hurwitz. I'm case manager for the Muncie Afghan Refugee Resettlement Committee um, in Muncie, Indiana. Sorry for those of you who are <laughs> Midwesterners or Muncie, Munsonians. Um, we are an all volunteer committee that sprang out of um, Awaken Inc., which is a local 501c non. C3 nonprofit that has worked for 20 years uh, providing education and healthcare funding to women and girls in the most rural parts of, oh, I can't, people are saying my video is broken up. I'm sorry. Erica, before uh, there was the need in regards to all of the uh, 74,000 Afghans coming over. So we quickly scaled up through that. We have 15 committees really focusing on every aspect of life, uh, employment, education, all of those things. We've made great community partnerships. Uh, we have the local Ball State University and Muncie Community Schools that have set up an ESL program for all of our new neighbors. We currently have 29 families, which will grow to 33 by the end of April and 109 new neighbors that I work with as case manager. Um, and like a lot of people have said, it's all about community partnerships. We have over 24 community partnerships, uh, all the way from healthcare organizations, universities, school systems, to like the soccer organization and Dick's Sporting Goods and that kind of thing. Um, you know, volunteers have been mentioned, you know, hundreds of volunteers. And um, our fundraising goal, which we haven't yet raised yet, but is about 400,000. We've raised 284 of it. Um, because as you all know who work in this, it all costs money. And our goal is to provide our new neighbors with six months of housing support, furnishing, um, all of those kinds of things so that they can really get on their feet. They can have jobs, they can establish themselves. And it's been tremendous. Um, there's a lot more to it, but you know that those are the very basics. And um, I, we'd be happy to help anybody out in other corners of the world, you know? Uh, it's all, uh, we're all working together for the same cause. That's exactly right. And this is one of the benefits of doing roundtables like this to bring together folks that are already doing the work um, to compound what's being done and also those who are interested in, in starting it. So um, anyone else will just, um, I will mute myself and jump in and share whatever you would like or ask questions. I just wanted to make one more comment, because Robert, uh, you had mentioned that story and it made me smile because one thing that I'll say is it's amazing with each family, any um, you know, feeling we had on what a refugee is or what an Afghan refugee even is, is thrown out the window when you hear all of the variety of experiences and you know, highly educated, not highly educated, speak fluent English, speak no English, you know, all of these things. And Robert's story really touched my heart um, because we see so much of this. You sit down for dinner and eat 12 plates of Afghan food and you start hearing the most incredible stories of unimaginable trauma that at least in Afghanistan is ongoing because of brothers being kidnapped or wives and kids who didn't make it over. Um, and then every joy is also uh, more pronounced because of that trauma. So it's really amazing. I have a quick question. Uh... Can you hear me? No. Okay. How? We could hear you. We can hear you. Ah, okay. Uh, I wasn't sure because sometimes my headset acts up. Uh, I had a question regarding um, how you handle like um, outreach and education to the uh, the existent rural community regarding the fact that seeking asylum is not illegal. 
I come from an area where <laughs> that's a huge issue uh, for a lot of people because they don't understand what seeking asylum actually is and that it's uh, it's actually a human right. So I was just curious how you handle that aspect. I'll just talk for like 20 seconds. And um, we do a tremendous amount of outreach. Um, secretly, of course, it's to do fundraising, but any outreach is outreach, right? So we've talked to you know dozens of churches and other organizations. And one of the things that I feel really resonates, and I don't know what populations you work with, but with Afghans, is when you start telling stories of the horrors that these families have gone through with the Taliban, it becomes pretty clear to people who would have otherwise had these feelings that you know, the only people who hate the Taliban more than Americans are Afghans, because they're the ones who, as much as we like to believe that we're the center of the universe and everything goes through our news sources, they're the ones who have their lives and civilization and communities blown up and destroyed by this, this group. And when you tell those stories, you get the same people who otherwise were sort of skeptical now realizing, oh, wow, these people feel the way I feel more than I feel it. So that this, the outreach has been huge, person by person and group by group, really. And if I could just piggyback on what Ari said, um, is you watch the horrors um, in Ukraine currently. And what I say to people is the Afghans have never known life to not be like that. And I, I just like to speak to the, um, the question was about asylum seekers in, in, in particular, which is a, who are in a different situation from refugees. Um, and of course, it, it's not common knowledge what the difference is between an asylum seeker and a refugee. Um, but but they are, it is a quite different situation because asylum seekers just don't don't have any assurance uh, from the from the US government before they get here that they're going to be able to stay and, and, and refugees do. But but it, but in terms of your question of how to deal with the the, the community's ignorance, of the fact that as seeking asylum is not illegal, <laughs> um, it, you know, it's it, it's just really you just have to keep um, talking about it. These people are here illegally. They do, no, they don't have a social security number. No, they don't have work authorization. But it is not illegal for them to be here claiming asylum. I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know that there's, you know, you you can write write letters to the editor. You know, ju it's just a constant. It, it requires just constant attention to, to, um, to helping the public to understand that, that, that these people have a right, it's a human right and an international legal right. And also uh, uh, they have a legal right within the United States, although the, the country doesn't often, often doesn't, <laughs> doesn't acknowledge that right, but they do have a right to claim asylum and it, and it isn't the same as being a refugee. Thank you, Judy. And we have a question from Jen, but I also wanted to mention, you know, a couple of our groups here specifically work with asylum seekers, but I think it's also important to, to note that, you know, we want to be welcoming to, to anyone who wants to come, even if they're not under duress, and that a lot of the new Americans we may be welcoming, um, you know, may move here for other reasons. And I think preparing our infrastructure for whatever is coming, whether it's sort of a, um, you know, a more like um, uh, asylum seeking, seeking situation or otherwise is important. And I think the, the groundbreaking work that's being done can, can work toward both ends. Um, Jen, go ahead. Yeah, not so much a question. I just want to sort of build on that because I, I mean, I work for an economic development organization. And so our role has been to help bring the resettlement agency to Brattleboro and to provide them organizational support and help Build the partnerships and networks, but then also we're working on the employment side. I think something that's really important to remember, so when you come at it from sort of the community-based side, you're kind of functioning in this non-structured, non-bureaucratic world, which is great because that's actually what people need the most of. Like this, this works best with volunteers, this works best with that kind of wraparound high touch. But I think the, the advantage I have is that I'm kind of working from the perspective of interfacing with those big bureaucracies, the Department of Labor with employers directly. And I can honestly say to sort of the previous question, there's not as much resistance as you think there is in a lot of places. There's, there can be ignorance, 
there can be potentially apathy, but there's also a lot of motivation. You know, employers are desperate for people. I have had no trouble getting people hired and getting employers to do incredible amounts of things to try to help people get to vaccinations and, you know, whatever. So I, I think just to sort of flip that question a little bit around, you know, as this becomes a thing that you're doing as volunteers and us bureaucratically sort of over the years, you know, we will need bigger, stronger partnerships because this will be unsustainable, especially if we want to be able to welcome the numbers of people that really need our help. Um, and I, I just, there are actually just really a lot of allies out there. And I think, um, you know, we have to keep talking, but um, I think we also, I was Steve Crofter who founded the Asylum Seekers Organization, CASP, over in um, Southeastern Vermont, told a story that kind of captured this early on about going out and fundraising and feeling really, really anxious and talking to someone that he knew that was, you know, a fairly conservative person in the community he assumed would be, uh, you know, against asylum seekers coming to the region. And he ended up being the most outspoken advocate for this work, you know, and it just touched his heart. So, you know, that's what we see over and over again. It's just compassion coming from all quarters. So. Jenya, go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm not, uh, I just want to add to the topic of a newcomers to America, not asylum seekers or refugee, because I came for another reason. And when I came, um, I couldn't find any information about anything happening. And I didn't even know there is a community which is a welcoming. And it took me a year to find like any kind of community organization which um which supports or give you information how to leave how to find friends how to find work and and i was expecting it to be the information available um like social security office because that's the first point when you come to to the united states you get you first get social security number so you you can pay taxes, but you don't get work permission and you don't get any information whatsoever. So you have to like go in town and search by yourself. Um, that's like, that would be great if all those organizations who work with refugees, with asylum seekers would be connected to the higher top or the first point of contact with newcomers. And I, I don't know how, how this work done. I, uh, when people still in their country, like Ukraine, because I don't see that work done. A friend who I tried to help to come to United States, but the only available way and recommended, it seems illegal uh, to go through Mexico. And like, I'm trying to find uh, the way for him and his friends get a like student visa or a work visa so they can come and start to be a part of community but i cannot find it's not easy at all like to, to do that and i'm not sure where where people are supposed to look for that so for me as the person who would like to help i don't even know where to go and i think it's a problem that it's not obvious that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jenya. Does anyone want to um, jump in? I think it's a, a great suggestion to have the organizations that are the first point of contact to have more resources and information easily available. Um, if anyone has any ideas of how Jenya could help her friends uh, get here and what processes and resources she be, should be looking at, um, if you could drop it in the chat, that would be great. Catherine. Thank you, Julianne, and thank you for everybody who's spoken today. Um, my name is Kathy Tegmeyer Pack, and I teach at a small college in Minnesota, in rural Minnesota called St. Olaf. And over the last eight years, I have worked with students who are taking a class with me to develop an online uh, resource where we can share information about groups like all of those who are represented here. Um, the website I'm going to drop into the chat. There are things about it that are really nice. There are things about it that are clunky and links that are broken and things that are incomplete. So please think of it as a proof of concept website. But it's written by undergraduates at our college. And um, 
At the moment, it's a little bit on hold while we do a project with a local partner, which we, I had done previously. But the purpose is to make it easy for people like you to find each other and to read about the work that you're doing. If this website is ever going to go any further, though, folks like you might need to be in charge of it and commissioning research from folks like me and my students. So I just wanted to share that to you. Um, and I'm going to also put my email in the uh, chat. And if anybody wanted to follow up with me and say, I'd like to think about that, um, please let me know. I have documents about this thing and you can take some time to look at it. But uh, yeah, thank you for giving me space to talk with you. And thanks again for all the work you're doing. Thank you, that's very interesting. Um, uh, Carla, is your um, comment or question related to what Catherine's saying or should we go to Deborah first? You can go to her first, but it's, it's related. Okay, all right. Um, Deborah. Well, this is fascinating. Um, I'm, um, so I lived all my life in New England. So I, I've been to or live near most of the places you're talking about. Um, I'm now in North Dakota. I came here for a job and it's a, a church organization that's forming that we have a startup that's just going to begin called Communities Acting Together for Change and Hope. Um, and it started out of a church organization, but it's now broad based across kind of the, the various community organizations you're talking about, state government. Um, I'm also having now arrived here and been here for a while, rural in New England and the other places I've been hearing about and rural here is very different. Um, from Keene, you can get most anywhere pretty quickly and, and so on. I'm curious, and I guess maybe the Nebraska folks might have a similar space to North Dakota in terms of real, that really spread out rural. Um, community, I would say here that the big driver is a workforce driver, is the communities are emptying out. And there's this tremendous love for the rural way of life. And um, just wondering if there are people on this call who have experience in welcoming immigrants, new Americans, for, in whatever path they're taking um, into rural communities. So I'm talking maybe 2000 people communities is what we'd two or 3000 population, you mostly with some kind of um, either agriculture or a factory, you know, a, a manufacturing of some kind. So curious about what you can offer about that. And I love what you're doing. And if there's no one on this call that's working with communities of that size um, to do this work, but you know of someone else who is another organization, then reach out to uh, Deborah and connect her if you can. Okay, um, if no one, does anyone wanna jump in on that or should we go to Carla? Uh, Carla. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to say with working with um, the newcomers population um, in the Latinx community, there's a, a very a, a large number of undocumented people. So we cannot forget, you know, the undocumented population that it's over 11 millions and that really brings a lot of, you know, obstacles for them when it comes to obtaining uh, any of the services from getting a driver's license to getting a job and you know that community has found a way to work around those obstacles to be able to survive and still thrive uh, whichever you know country you're from and you're undocumented in this country i think that organizations have to bring awareness to that and have to offer the services you know to the community um, and not be afraid to acknowledge that there's a huge amount of people that are undocumented in this country um, and also for CVFIs to be able to also provide the support um, for those people that want to start a business because as an undocumented person, you can obtain um, a business, you can establish a business without having a social security number and be able to not even have to, um, you know, 
have that social security number to continue on with your life. So there's a lot of resources and information that um, there is out there to help undocumented people to continue to be uh, thrive in this country. That's a great note. Thank you so much for that. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to bring up just quickly. One is Veronica. I had a question for you. The, you know, the Center for Rural Affairs has been around for a long time and has this great infrastructure for su supporting folks. But as you said, the the private businesses are really taking lead on on a lot of the funding and kind of recruiting process and everything to get folks there. Do you know if any of them have any sort of you know, model that they're working off of that could be shared with other um, businesses in the country who may be interested in doing the same thing? I don't know at the top of my head, but I can definitely find out because we have a few of them in town and, and I know the contact information for them. So I can just move some strings here and there and get you the information for sure. Awesome. That would be great. Thank you. I, I think that would be really interesting to other businesses who may be interested in, in doing something similar. Sure. Um, I also, we have Becky Field on here. I, I wanted to ask Becky if you would like to talk a little bit about your work. So I mentioned that Radically Rural takes place in September, our national summit. And I really encourage all of you to come because this sort of energy and conversation is even better in person. And it is hybrid, you can attend virtually as well, but everything that happens during that summit is just really incredible. We'd love to have you. And around that time, we have an international festival that happens in the area as well. And so Becky Field is a photographer and she is focused on capturing the joy of uh, new Americans in our communities. And so we're gonna have an exhibit in the month of September in our area. And so folks who attend Radically Rural could also view this exhibit as well. And Becky, I wanted to just give you a quick minute if you'd like to talk about your work. Sure, thank you very much. I've, I've just really enjoyed hearing all about the work that others are doing and the, the geographic range of, of the people on this call, it's really remarkable. And I, I think this kind of thing is so important. So for the last 10 years, I've been uh, photographing the, uh, the lives and the um, honoring the celebration of new Americans in New Hampshire. And um, it's, it's turned into really a, a, a very interesting project. I, I've published a couple of books on it. And in fact, I'm going to just very quickly um, share my screen here to show you um, a little bit about this. The overall project is called Different Roots, Common Dreams. It documents the lives of New Hampshire's immigrants and refugees. And this really works in this state because New Hampshire is so white. Um, it's a statewide project. I've, I've got over 60 countries of origin among the people that I photograph. And all the photographs that I do are taken in New Hampshire, which often surprises people because of the fact that we're so white. Um, Let's see, hang on a second here. Okay, here we go. Um, so, yes, here we go. So the project goals, as I say, are to bring attention to the diversity in New Hampshire, but also to honor the immigrants themselves and to stimulate public discussion about immigration and diversity. Um, and I've I do that through talks and um, multiple talks, multiple exhibits and uh, various kinds of events uh, going to uh, fairs and, and multicultural festivals and that kind of thing, which has just really been a wonderful experience for me. Um, I, as I said, I published two books. The first one is 2015. It was Different Roots, Common Dreams, New Hampshire's Cultural Diversity. This is mostly photographs with a few stories at the end about the uh, journeys of uh, refugees. And then the second book came out, of course, in the middle of the pandemic, which was a challenge in terms of, of distributing it, but it's done really well. This book has won eight awards. And uh, I think the reason it's got so much attention is because it's not just my portraits of the people, but it's their stories in their own words of their journey of resettling. And, um, and I think someone was mentioning earlier about the different ways that people come and, and that immigrants can come in a variety of ways with a variety of needs and interests and objectives in coming to this country and coming to New Hampshire. And um, this is highlighted in this book through these stories. There are 40 different um, immigrant families represented through portraits and through their stories. And one of the things that I've done in this exhibit is I did record the interviews. So in the exhibits that I do on this, 
I not only have the portrait and an excerpt of the of their the person's story next to it, but I also have a little QR code where if you hold up your smartphone and I, I manage to download a little audio file from this, you can hear the rich um, uh, accents of the immigrants. So it really becomes sort of a multimedia exhibit, which it just really delights me because people can see the immigrants, they can read about their story and they can hear their voices. And I just think that's a great way to honor our new Americans. So I am gonna be involved in, in, in this kind of a, a community-wide event in Keene in the fall. And we're gonna have multiple exhibits and multiple presentations. And I'm really looking forward to work, working with all of, all of the folks in Keene that are doing such amazing work in, in honoring and accompanying um, uh, refugees uh, to that rural community. So thank you so much. And I hope to see you all in the fall. Thank you, Becky. All right, we have time for one more um, comment, brief story, question. I'll mute myself. No takers? All right, I guess it's time to, um, to wrap up here and spin the wheel to see who won the, the ticket to Radically Rural. And Lillian, do you need another minute or are you all set with it? I should be all set with it. Okay. Okay. Hey. Kathy is the winner. Thanks so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Yay. And as I said, it is hybrid. So although we'd love to have you here, um, you don't have to come in order to enjoy that. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll definitely get you the information for that. And I just want to give such a huge uh, thank you to those who spoke and asked questions and shared their stories. And I hope that we can just continue the process together and keep learning together, share um, what we know and, and what we'd still like to learn. And um, I'm sure there will be plenty of opportunities in the future to continue this conversation. So thank you all again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>